Hello YouTube, the Teach here with another read aloud. Today we're reading A Jar of Dreams, Chapter 6 by Yoshiko Chida. Here we go. Ant Waka's ship, the Tayomuru, was already docked when Papa got to Pier 35. I was surprised at how high it rode in the water, and a long gangplank was pushed up for the first and second class passengers. There was a shorter one towards the stern for the people in third class, and that's where I went to wait for Aunt Waka. Every time a Japanese lady came down the gangplank, Joji would holler, There she is! Is that her? And Mom would shake her head and say, No, no, not yet. Not yet. After a while, Mama got nervous. Suppose she isn't on the ship, Papa. Suppose something happened to her. But Papa only said, For heaven's sake, Mama, what on earth could happen to her? Where could she go? Of course she's on the ship. We waited and waited while a whole while a lot more people came down the gangplank. Then suddenly Mama called out, There she is. Waka. Waka. And before Papa could stop her, Mama pushed her away right past all the people in front of us and climbed halfway up the gangplank to greet her sister. Now Waka was wearing a blue kimono with wavy white stripes rippling down like a lot of little rivers, and her hair was piled up on a bun on top of her head. I was surprised to see how gray it was, since she was younger than Mama, although I thought probably it's because of all the tragedies in her life. I took a, I took a quick look at her feet, but couldn't tell if anything was wrong with, her, with either one. She did have a slight limp, though, and was having a hard time trying to hold onto the railing with one hand and carry a small cloth bundle on the other. Mama took the bundle from her, and the two of them came down together, walking like they'd never stop, and walk about at least a half dozen times to Papa, saying all the proper and polite things she was supposed to say, and Papa bowed back, but not as many times. We're all so glad you've come, Waka, he said to her. When she got to me, she smiled just the way Mama does, crinkling up her eyes. Ah, Rinko, she said. How nice to meet you at last. I didn't know what to say back to her, so I asked if she got seasick, and she only said for the first three days. That's good, I said. Then you can eat all the good stuff Mama made for you. And thank goodness, she, she said, certainly could. Joji didn't know what to say to her either. He just stuck his hand down and shook hers, looking as solemn as a little owl. He didn't utter a sound. He does that sometimes when Mama and Papa's friends are over for Sunday dinner. While we're waiting for Papa to say grace, he'll just sit at the dining room table, separating all the food in his plate so the rice and the meat and the vegetables don't touch each other. Then he won't say a single word in the entire meal, not even to me. It can be so boring. That's why I like to invite Tammy to come over on Sundays so I'll at least, at least have someone to talk to. I sat in the back seat of the car with Mama and Aunt Waka, and they talked and laughed and cried all the way home. Mama told her about our new home laundry, and but mostly they talked about how things were when they were growing up in Japan. I watched Aunt Waka out of the corner of my eye, trying not to stare at her. So far, she didn't sound like she'd be such a bleak, sorrowful presence, but it was still too early to tell. When we were almost home, Aunt Walker turned to me and asked if I was healthier now, and I told her I was. I drink two extra glasses of milk every day, I said, sounding like a five-year-old feeling like a stupid ninny. But Aunt Walker just said, that's good, Rinko. I brought you more medicine for your knee aches, too. And she reached out and patted my knees. I wish Mama hadn't written it. Aunt Waka, every single detail of my life. I guess I get those because I'm trying to grow too fast, I explained. Like a noodle, Aunt Waka said. Suddenly, we both laughed. And that's when I, I thought maybe Aunt Waka was going to be an okay person after all. As soon as we got home, she wanted to open up her big willow basket and give us all presents she brought. So Papa untied the ropes and opened it up. And I sat on the bed and watched her take everything out. Grandma and Grandpa had sent all kinds of things, like cans of new spring tea and salt rice crackers, pectures of dried seaweed and mushrooms, and big chunks of bonita and as hard as rocks for shaving into flakes to make broth. They sent a lot of stuff from the pharmacy, too, like small brown bottles with my tiny gold pills and packages of herbs for, for curing colds and some stomach disorders and plasters for back and shoulder aches. 
There were presents for each of us from Aunt Wonka, too. She brought silk neckties for Papa and Cal, and a handwoven shawl for Mama, a set of watercolors for Joji, and for me, a silk kimono she had sewn herself. Try it on, Rinko, she said when she gave it to me. I'll do it later on, I said. What I really had in mind was I put it in Mama's trunk in the basement with all her kimonos and probably never look at it again. Actually, I wish she brought me something I could make use of, like Joji's watercolors, but I try not to look too envious. Mama tried to put all Mama put all the food out on the dining room table, and pretty soon people from church came over with even more food. Miss Sugar came too, with a two-layer spice cake. But she didn't say long because she couldn't understand all the Japanese talk. She surprised Aunt Waka by giving her a big hug, and Aunt Waka surprised her back by speaking some English she'd learned in school. I found out Aunt Waka knew a lot more English than I thought she'd know. I avoided all the bowing and greeting and jabbering going on in the parlor by standing in the kitchen to fill the teapots with hot water. The minute Tammy came with her mother, she came rushing to the kitchen to look for me. I saw that she had her good Sunday dress, too, and she had stuck a ribbon in her hair. Tammy has long hair that's parted on the side, and whomever has it, and who, and whenever is there, it is a special occasion. She ties it in a big bow. S Tammy is prettier than I am. She has bigger eyes and very fair skin, which she protects by using her mom's freckle cream. She's also also about two inches taller than I am. Like how she got all the good things because she came first. In fact, I guess she got everything there was to get because she's an only child, which I'm certainly glad I'm not. But I hate to admit it, but Tammy's also braver than I am. Like the time we got turned away at the crystal plunge and the lady wouldn't let us go swim to swim there. I was so embarrassed. I just wanted to run and hide. But Tammy just stood there and asked, why not? Why can't we go in? Because I know you wouldn't enjoy it here. We would too, came in some saying, but the lady gave Tammy a funny kind of smile and said, I'm sorry, I can't sell you a ticket. By that time, everyone else in line was staring at us and I wanted to disappear into the sidewalk. So I could finally, so I finally pulled Tammy away and we came back home together. The first thing Tammy said to me when she came bursting in the kitchen after that afternoon was, where's Uncle Kanda? You mean your mama wants to start matching them up already? Why not? Tammy wanted to know. The sooner the better. If your Aunt Waka gets married here, she won't have to go back to Japan. Mama wouldn't let Mama would like that, all right, I said. Uncle Kanda wouldn't come until after he'd close up his shop. And by that time most of the people had gone home. But Tammy and her mama mama waited for him. Tammy and I watched Papa introduce him to Aunt Waka, and she bowed six times to him, just like she did to Papa. I guess she was showing him respect because of his white hair, not knowing, of course, that he wasn't all that old or decrepit, even though he looks like sort of hunched up like a gray dormouse. That's because he did so much close work. And that's why he wore those glasses with the thick lenses. Well, why don't we all sit down and have supper? Papa said as though we hadn't been eaten all afternoon. So Mama heated up the soybean soup, and we all sat down again to eat with Uncle Kanda so he'd have some company. He said how nice it was to have Sunday dinner with us, even if it was only Saturday. And I was afraid he thought he'd already used up his visit for the week, so I told him he could come again the next day, just like he usually did. He smiled at me and then said, Thank you, Rinko. It's a nice thought to hold on to. Tammy's mother sat next to Aunt Waka and told her every good thing she knew about Uncle Kanda, like how he was the best tailor in Berkeley and had a pros prosperous dry cleaning business near Papa's bar barbershop and was a pillar of our Japanese church. I saw Aunt Waka nodding and trying to be polite, but she was also yawning without, without opening her mouth, which is very hard to do. I know because I do that a lot myself when I have to sit in church and listen to those boring sermons. Every once in a while, Uncle Kanda would lean to, toward Aunt Waka to ask her a question like, how is crossing the, on the Tianju Maru? Or tell me, are your parents quite well? Every time Aunt Waka smiled and answered him, and Tammy would poke me with her elbow, kick my foot, or try to wink at me. Sometimes Cammy can, can, can be so obvious or just as bad as her mother. I was sure Aunt Waka must be catching on by then, 
to what they were up to. It was downright embarrassing. I didn't want to have a, I didn't have a chance to talk to Aunt Walka myself until we were all getting ready for bed, and I sm smelled incense coming from our room. Hey, Joji, do you smell incense? I asked. And Joji rubbed his nose. Yeah, it sure stinks. Maybe Aunt Walka's trying to purify my room. She's probably trying to get rid of all your germs. I know Joji's remarks and tried to peek through the keyhole to what used to be in my room, but I couldn't see anything because I always leave the keys in the keyhole so no one can look in on me. I guess it served me right, not being able to see anything then. But I couldn't hear Aunt Walka's but I could hear Aunt Walka's mumbling in a low voice, the way Mama does when she's saying her prayers. By then, I was so curious I couldn't stand it, so I knocked on her door and walked in before Aunt Walka could answer. I forgot my bathrobe, I said, fibbing. It's in my closet. Aunt Walka was standing in my, at my bureau with her hands clasped, and I saw she had set up a small Buddhist altar on top of it. There were photographs of her husband and little boy besides it, and stick of incense and a dish with two cookies on it in front of the pictures. I was just telling my husband and my little boy I had arrived safely in America, she told me. I always talk to them when I pray for them. Oh, I felt like I barged into something private and special and I had no business seeing. How strange, I thought. Aunt Waka was a Buddhist and Mama was such an ardent Christian. What was going to happen? I wondered when Mama took Aunt Waka to our church and made her sing, Jesus, save her, pilot me, or pray to God, who was her own special friend. Aunt Waka suddenly seemed like a stranger I might never really get to know. And how were we ever going to take her to take her any place if she went everywhere in a kimono? I started to look walk back out of my room, but then she told me to come in. She she didn't seem to mind if I watched her finishing finish her praying with her praying. What are the cookies for? I asked. I knew very well her husband and little boy couldn't come out of the photo to eat them. Aunt Wonka smiled. It's just a gesture, she said. It makes me feel as though I shared something with the, nice with them. Then she surprised me by giving me one of the cookies and taking one for herself. You and I will eat them for my little boy, she said, and I will, I think, he'll like that. But I've already brushed my teeth. That's all right. One little cookie won't hurt. I really wanted to stay and talk with Aunt Waka, but I heard Mama's footsteps coming from the kitchen. I'll take it back to bed with me, I said. I rubbed. And I rushed out, forgetting all about my bathrobe I was supposed to look for. Georgie and Maxwell were already snoring, but I pulled the covers over my head so I wouldn't make too much noise crunching my cookie. I could feel the crumbs getting all over my bed, and I knew it was probably going to end up in between my toes. But I wasn't busy thinking. Of, but I was busy thinking about Aunt Waka. How different she seemed from Mama. It wasn't just because she came from Japan. It was something else. Something that made her seem sort of special. I wasn't sure what it was. But then I had all summer to find out. And that's chapter six of A Jar of Dreams by Yoshiko Chida. Read by Mr. Patino. Be sure to like and subscribe. I'll talk to you later. Bye.